All right. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, I am not John O'Sullivan. My name is uh, Pat Crater, and I'm the supervisor of athletics, but it will be my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Mr. O'Sullivan uh, in just a few minutes here. Um, but before we get started, I just want to take this opportunity to really thank everybody for being here. Um, you may have had other commitments, um, perhaps you wanted to spend time with family uh, this evening, um, but instead you chose to uh, be with us uh, to, um, to make a difference in, in our entire community. So uh, thank you for your commitment to our community, uh, to our uh, athletic program, um, and to, to all of our kids. Um, I really appreciate everybody who uh, came out tonight. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Sandville. He's in attendance this evening, along with other uh, district administrators um, and also uh, many school board members who were able to join us this evening. Uh, Mr. O'Sullivan would not be able to join us uh, this evening if it wasn't for the support of our administration and our school board as well. So we thank you very much um, for, uh, for bringing this, uh, for bringing Mr. O'Sullivan here and, uh, and allowing everybody to have this great opportunity. So uh, changing the game, um, I have my copy right here, and, and I know many, um, many of you had a chance to, uh, to get your hands on, uh, on changing the game book. Uh, my first day on the job, or maybe it was the first week on the job, I, I can't quite remember, but um, a parent came in and, and asked for a meeting. And uh, I'm really grateful for that opportunity because when I started at Unionville, um, I never worked here before, I, I didn't grow up here. Um, I went to school in Westchester, and that's about the closest that I got uh, to Unionville. So it was a great opportunity for me to uh, start my journey um, and, and learn more and more about the, uh, the school district. And at the conclusion of that meeting, uh, this parent handed me a copy of Changing the Game. Um, and I'm so glad that she did that. It took me a few months to, uh, to get my head on straight in the new job and everything. Uh, but once I got my hands on the book and I was able to dig in, um, I realized that this is indeed a, a great perspective on sports. Um, and I can say that um, even in my own household, uh, my oldest is five, um, and, uh, and I have a three-year-old son as well. And uh, there are lessons in here that are, um, um, they're, they're great lessons for uh, our high school and middle school athletes, um, but also for, um, you know, those youth athletes as well, um, all the way down to my five-year-old who kicks the soccer ball in the cul-de-sac. Um, so um, this book made me a better person, um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to everybody having the opportunity to speak with Mr. O'Sullivan. Um, uh, this evening. Uh, Mr. O'Sullivan joined us uh, uh, today at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. He met with uh, a number of our student athletes from the middle school and the high school. Uh, later in the morning, uh, there was an opportunity to meet with a committee called the Values Ambassadors, um, and that was uh, some great conversations happened there. We had lunch with some other stakeholders and then a dinner as well with some more stakeholders. Um, and I can say that, um, you know, after everything I heard today, I could not be more excited uh, for uh, tonight's presentation. And, um, and again, once again, I'm really happy that, uh, that everybody was able to join us. Uh, so with that said, let me introduce Mr. O'Sullivan. Uh, John O'Sullivan is, is an internationally known TEDx speaker and the founder of the Changing the Game Project, which he started in 2012. He is the author of two number one best-selling books and leading youth sports blogger. He is the host of the Way of Champions podcast, one of the top rated podcasts in the world of, for coaches. A former collegiate and, pro and professional soccer player and has coached for over 20 years on the youth, high school, and college levels. He has consulted with U.S. Olympic Committee, U.S. Soccer, USA Football, U.S. Lacrosse, USA Swimming, Ireland Rugby, Aussie Rules Football, and many more. Mr. O'Sullivan is, a national, is on the National Advisory Board for the Positive Coaching Alliance and the National Association for Physical Literacy. Once again, we are so excited and grateful for Mr. O'Sullivan to be joining this evening. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Every time he says Mr. O'Sullivan, I keep looking for my dad. Um, well, this is great. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful evening. Thank you so much for taking the time away from your kids, from your families, to spend some time with me. Um, I hope that tonight we cover some things that make you say at the end of it, like, wow, I'm so, I'm so glad I came 
to that. I'm so glad I got something out of it. It's been great what this community is doing from the new values and standards that you're gonna start hearing about that were just adopted by the school board to uh, meeting some of the student athletes. I'm gonna tell you some of what they said in a little bit here to um, meeting again, a lot of the stakeholders and the people in the wellness movement around this community. Um, again, my background was, I grew up on Long Island. I played college soccer at Fordham University. I played professionally for a little bit after that. I got injured, I uh, went on to coaching, coached uh, Division I college soccer at University of Vermont for a couple years, uh, then moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and then uh, I live in Oregon now where I've been um, for uh, 13 years. And um, my journey as a, you know, a, as a coach to a father of two middle schoolers now, um, to the founder of this organization, really started uh, a couple years ago um, when my daughter was very young, and I was coaching or I was watching this team. Right, these are the mighty unicorns. Right, this is my daughter's first soccer team. And I'm watching this six-year-old soccer game, and it was the perfect six-year-old sport. Who's been to a six-year-old soccer game? Right, so you know like the giant blob, right? And they can score in either goal, and they're equally as excited. And so the parents are positive, and the coaches are positive. There's no referee to yell at. And I'm thinking, this is great, right? This is what sport's supposed to be about. And then right next door is a 10-year-old competitive soccer game. And it's competitive not because... The kids are competing harder because all the adults are competing harder, right? And I'm watching the, the coaches and the parents scream at the kids, scream at each other. They're all screaming at the ref who's like 13, right? And all I'm thinking to myself is anyone on my field saying, God, I can't wait to do that, right? In a couple of years, we get to spend more money and more time so my kid can have less fun, right? And so the two things that really crossed my mind were, why is this happening? And number two was, well, who's running this league? And it was me, it was my league. And so that's kind of how Change in the Game Project was born. And now, as Pat said, we're, we travel all around the world doing sport development, trying to make it better for, for children, for coaches, and for parents. Because you, I mean, you are, if you are here tonight, you love your kids or your grandkids, right? You are engaged in making this a better thing. Um, the biggest problem in sport right now is we lose three quarters of kids by middle school. Three quarters of our children are gone from organized sport by the age of 13. And here's what we know, that a child who is active in adolescence, 12 years old, is very, very likely to be active throughout their entire life. They do better in school. They're less likely to do drugs or, or teenage pregnancy. They're more likely to go to college. They have lower health care costs in their life. They make more money in their life. And they're more likely to raise active kids. And children who are out of sports and who are not active by age 12, they're very likely not to be active any time in their life. We have a huge wellness issue in this country around physical activity and motion. We also know that those kids, right, they will do better in school when they're active and when they're moving. So we have to keep kids in sport. Sport has this great opportunity to keep kids playing. But I think we've kind of um, lost sight of how to do that. So let me ask you, like, raise your hand if you played sports growing up. And if you're young and still growing up, you can raise your hand, right? Okay, so what is different, and you can kind of just put your hand up and put out a few things. What is different about sports today than it was for you growing up? Yes. Right. Right, so, so young, you know, earlier specialization, have, being forced to pick one sport really, really young. Huge thing. Yes, sir. Travel sports. So the death of in-town leagues and then also probably the death of like free play, go meet your friends and play at the park as well. Oh, was that a hand there? Yeah. Everyone can play. Everyone That's what we think, you mean? Yeah. That's, what, that's the myth you mean? Like we think everyone can make the Olympics? No, I'm saying that in, in our day, everyone was welcome. Yes, yes, exactly. So it was much more welcoming, 
right? Right now, we just the Aspen Institute released new numbers where, um, this, you know, especially demographically, something like, you know, if your family makes over $100,000 a year, about 37% of those kids play organized sports, but when it gets down below 50,000, it gets down to like less than 20% as compared to a country like Norway, right, very small population, won 38 medals in the last Olymp Winter Olympics, um, where 93% of the 13-year-olds play a sport. 93%. Yes? It's more expensive. It's more expensive. Or uniform, Yeah. That's what always amazes me, right, being a soccer guy. Like, you need a sort of round thing and a kind of flat thing, space, right? And yet, we're like, okay, well, that's a $125 uniform for the six-year-olds, right? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I think Time Magazine, you know, pinned the number around $15 billion a year is the youth sports industry now. All right, huge, yeah. Uh, less parents want to volunteer to coach. Mm-hmm. Why would you? <laughs> yeah, no, but the parental involvement, the volunteer coaches, right? Um, it's harder to get people out. Part of it's because, you know, a lot of people are working and working more, and, um, but yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, of changes here, and I think there's a couple of um, big reasons that I want to talk about why kids are dropping out of sports at such a high rate, because this is what we have to overcome as, as parents and as coaches. So here's big reason number one, and someone said it. He's very good, to be fair. <laughs> right, so the, the push for early specialization, more, 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 younger, younger, younger. Um, and, and it's a push driven not by what the science says around what children need in sport, nor is it a push around the science of what people need to do to be elite in sport, um, but it's a push, again, on sort of the business of sport. So. What the science says is that outside of female figure skating and gymnastics, where those athletes to get to a really high level, there's a, a lot that they have to learn and do before they hit their growth spurt, right? But in most sports, all the team sports, lacrosse and soccer and all that, those athletes don't hit their athletic peak until their, their mid-20s. So this idea that you're supposed to put in um, all these hours really, really young is not based on the sports science piece. Now, um, a couple years ago, uh, a guy, one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell, wrote a book called Outliers. And he talked about something called the 10,000 hour rule. Who's heard of that? Right? Who knows it's not true? Right? There's no such thing as a 10,000 hour rule. There's no study that says there's 10,000 hours to expertise. A man named Anders Ericsson, a psychologist, and to be fair to Anders Ericsson, he didn't say this in his research. What he was studying was how people practice, what he calls deliberate practice. But he did some research around um, the a small group of elite violinists who, uh, who self-reported how many hours they thought they practiced growing up. Then he averaged up the ones who were the very best in this Berlin School of Music, and he said, oh, 10, you know, about 10,000 hours uh, of practice for these ones. But the problem is, even to this day, he never published the range of his study. Range meaning, well, in that average of 10,000 hours, right, were there any people who practiced more than 10,000 ho 10, hours and not elite? And were there any people who practiced less than 10,000 hours and were elite? And in fact, there probably were. Right? Because it's not just about practice. But this idea of 10,000 hours, there was sports clubs all over the world saying, oh, we got to map out 10,000 hours. That's this many hours a week for this many years. And all of a sudden, you can't do anything else. When the actual research around elite level performance, when they look at pretty good athletes like Olympians, 
show that on average they play three sports until they're 13 or 14 years old. And those sports-specific hours, the, the big pile of them come later, not earlier. Right? So this cult, David Epstein calls it the cult of the head start, is really, really dangerous for our kids. Now, there's dozens and dozens of papers that show that children who specialize in a sport prior to the age of 12 are more likely to burn out, drop out, 70% more likely to get injured, right? And oftentimes when they leave sport, they don't come back to any sport ever. So they not only quit basketball, they quit movement and they walk away, okay? So this is one of the things when kids are forced to specialize, they lose ownership of the activity. And it's very, very damaging. Okay, and I wanted to say, I forgot to say before, if you have a question while we're going, please raise your hand. If you're in the back, like wave like you're drowning because it's kind of hard to see. But um, yeah, I, I love discussions more than just me talking. But that's myth number one that drives a lot of kids out of sports. Here, here's, here's another one. The early emphasis on winning in cuts and tryouts. All those boys are 12. All right, a 12 year old boy could have a five-year developmental age swing, which means you could have the body of a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old. Now, you'd never play your 10-year-olds against your 15-year-olds, but I have a 12-year-old son, and this is what the games look like, right? Little League World Series, great example. Every summer, we, we, we watch this, and we're told by the announcers of these amazing, look at this amazing pitcher from California, and he struck out everybody and whatever. And I'm just looking at him going, he has a mustache. <laughs> right? He's not really 12. He is on the calendar. So what happens is, right, when we put a really, really early emphasis on making cuts and making all-star teams, which kids do we pick besides the coach's kid? That's a different talk. No. <laughs> Which kids get picked? The big ones, the strong ones, taller, who are usually born when? Yeah, if, if your cutoff is January 1, they're far more likely to born, be born January, February, March. If they're born in the first quartile of the year, after whatever your arbitrary calendar cutoff date is, they will be identified as talented, when really what, what they are is mature physically mature. This is a problem in schools, too, when we identify kids for talented and gifted programs, and, you know, if the cutoff is September 1st for a school year, and you got a kid born in late July, he or she is very unlikely, far less likely to be identified as a gifted student than someone who's born in September, right? And this push to do things younger exacerbates it even more, right? I have this video here um, from Australia. This is a, a nine-year-old rugby game in Australia. Kind of made my point, right? Is that kid nine? You see the kids in the blue, like they were running just close enough to him that their dad wouldn't yell at them. There's no way I'm tackling that kid. <laughs> right? Now it's not the kid's fault, but that's not rugby. Rugby's a team game, right? It doesn't look like rugby, right? So we when the earlier we try to identify talent, the earlier we try to group it, the earlier we make cuts, the more we get it wrong. We have this amazing example every year in this country of how bad we are at talent identification. Right? When professional NFL teams spend tens of millions of dollars and they can't get it right with 23-year-olds. And then when you meet people who are like, oh yeah, those nine-year-olds, I can pick them, right? There's no way. 
I have a friend named Joe Baker who's a sports scientist out of Canada. He said, how would we coach if we coached with the assumption that we got the tryouts all wrong? Because really, that's what we do. How would we coach if we just assumed that we were really bad at picking kids instead of really good at picking kids? And really, the best system, to go back to a Nor Norway, as many kids as possible, as long as possible, in the best environment possible. And then let them grow, and then try to pull out some kids who might be on a, a true talent track. But we wash them all out so young, right, in the search you know, for that. And then we pay a lot of attention to the unicorns, the unicorns like the Tiger Woods or the Williams sisters. Well, you know, there's a, for, for every Tiger Woods, there's 100,000 kids who hate golf and hate their dad. <laughs> right? But we, we, no one writes articles about the ones that didn't make it because you can't track them. Right? You can't track them. So we have to be super, super careful in this regard, right? And in a community like this, we had a discussion at lunch today, and I don't remember if it was just a personal discussion or, or the group, we were talking about middle school sports and how this high school struggles when middle school basketball um, has 18 kids and cuts it down to 11, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, two of them pick other sports and two of them decide they don't like basketball, and all of a sudden there's only six freshmen trying out for basketball. Right? Instead of having as many middle schoolers playing basketball as possible. Never mind the fact that, you know, every high school AD I meet is like, yeah, I, I have a 6'7 kid walking the hall who doesn't play basketball because he got cut by someone's dad in fourth grade. Right? Because he hadn't grown yet and he was kind of awkward. Okay? So we need to do better in this regard. I like this little thing, right? Talent is not linear, it doesn't develop in a straight line, it's messy. It goes in fits and starts. And, and we have to create space where we focus on, well, what's the right finish line? And then we gotta guide people towards that, okay? So, how do we keep kids in sports? Well, we first have to understand why they play. I like the kid at the end, he's, right? You think he's discussing tactics? No, right? right? So why do children play sports? What's the number one answer? Fun. I asked the student athletes today, this morning, 30 middle school and high school kids, if there is one message you would like me to give to the parents tonight, what would that be? And these are some of the best athletes in this high school. And they said, make it fun. Let us have fun. Right, let us enjoy this time with our friends and things. Don't suck the joy out of this moment. Joy is so important. My business partner works pretty closely with Steve Kerr, who's a coach of a pretty good basketball team called the Golden State Warriors. And the number one core value of the Warriors is joy. It's joy. It's got to be enjoyable. You've got to love it. You've got to love what you do. So there's a lot of research around this, um, and I think this research is important. Most people ask the first question, why do kids play fun, and then they move on. So this woman named Amanda Visick from George Washington University, she decided to dive a little further into that. So she said, okay, well, um, define fun. And kids came up with 81 characteristics that make sports fun. There's the top six, right? Trying your best, being treated with respect, getting playing time. Right? Playing well as a team, getting along with your teammates, being active, exercising. There's a few things further down the list. Winning number 48. I've never coached a game where there was 47 things more important than did we win. Apparently there were for the kids. I learned this when my daughter was 10 years old. I, I flew in from a speaking engagement and I went to just watch her play at her, you know, uh, in Portland, Oregon at her first away soccer tournament, travel soccer tournament. Our team was really bad. And they lose 10 nothing. And I'm sitting there on the sideline, and I'm embarrassed and kind of angry, and I can't believe I'm buying a hotel for this junk and whatever, and you know. We all feel this. And so I'm sitting there, and then I'm thinking, ah, you know what, I gotta be a good dad here. I gotta you know, drink my own Kool-Aid. What am I gonna say to my daughter after this game? She's gonna be embarrassed like me. So the game ends, and her and her teammates are walking over 
walk across the field. I walk out, I'm like, hey, Mag, how you doing? She goes, Dad, the hotel has a pool. <laughs> All right, let's go swim, right? So, you know, just understanding why they're there. Now, as they get older, this study was done, kids age eight to 18, about 80% of them multi-sport, um, recreational level to competitive level. She's trying to expand the study now, get a grant to look at a lot more kids so they can, you know, correct for demographics and things like that. But as athletes get older and, and graduate to different ages and stages, right, they might define joy differently, but they still say fun. They still say joy, right? Joy, is anyone here like a, have been a competitive runner? or anything like that. I mean, a couple of people, right? Like, my competitive runner friends, like, like, if they do a track workout and they vomit, they consider that fun. I don't know if you consider that fun. No, well, you're shaking your head. But they're like, God, that was awesome. I can't wait to do that again. Like, that's the last thing I would ever want to do, right? Um, I, you know, I love to ski, and I do a lot of, like, ski mountaineering. Now, I will ski all day and, and hike up stuff until my legs are shaking, and, um, and say, God, that was the best day. I can't wait to do that again. But if you ask me to go for like a 15 minute run, I will avoid it like the plague. I would like rather do dishes, right? Right? Because what brings me joy is different. Okay? So this is really important. What makes it less fun? Now, this man, Tim Galway, many years ago wrote a great book called The Inner Game of Tennis and he has what he calls the performance equation. Performance is potential minus interference. So how our kids play is potential, their hours of practice, their genetics, all these things, minus interference. The single greatest thing that interferes with performance is between their ears. Right? The golf great Bobby Jones said, uh, golf is played on a five inch course. Right? Golf is played, on, and I think all sports are played on a five inch field. I used to think uh, my job as a coach was to layer more and more on, but I think it's actually to strip stuff away. The more we can strip away, the better they're going to play. So I think we understand this in a lot of aspects of our kids' life. So I have a couple videos here. First video is my daughter when she was at her first piano recital. I want you to watch what happens when she makes a mistake. That's pretty good, right? She's three months into it. Do anyone think her piano teacher would yell at her when she bobbles or anything like that would help? No. Every time I'm in an auditorium, I think of things like this. Like I have two middle schoolers who are in middle school band, right? Who's been to a middle school band concert? Have you ever seen a dad stand up and go, the woodwinds are killing us tonight? <laughs> no, that wouldn't make sense at all, right? Yet all of a sudden, right, we go to our kids' sporting events and something clicks. So now I have a video of a six-year-old soccer game. Is anyone worried that it was filmed here? No, it's not. Don't worry. Northern California. All right? Six-year-old soccer game. I got it. I got it. 
the some of the guys filming at the end. She's like a cheerleader on crack. Do you think she loves her kids? Yeah. She's loving them in a helpful way. Go, 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 kick it, follow that ball. Like, I think they got that part. All right? Think about a game like soccer or lacrosse, right? In a split second, a kid has to um, perceive the situation around them, come up with possible solutions to the problem that the game presents, choose one, they're clever, add deception, technically execute it, and assess their choice and move on that fast. So how much input can they actually take? Actually can't take any. Coaching the kid in the ball is ridiculous. Because if they're listening to you, they've already missed the play. Right? So I want to show you what this feels like. Um, the psychologist John Ridley Stroop in 1935, it's called the Stroop Test. It's one of the most repeated psychological experiments of all time. And what he proved was that if you add cognitive interference, it actually slows down the physical reaction time of a task. So it's a two-part test. So here's Stroop Test Part 1. We're going to do this as a room. If you're competitive, the record's eight and a half seconds. So when I say go, out loud as a room, as fast as you can go, we're going to read all four lines. Green, yellow, purple, red, yellow, blue, yellow. Right? All four lines. Out loud as fast as we can go. All right? Does anyone need to, like, stretch? Or... <laughs> okay. Ready? So out loud as fast as we can go. All four lines. I'll stop the watch when the last voice goes silent. On your mark. Get set. Go. It was pretty good. It was like 10. It's not bad. The bigger the group, the harder it it is. Why why are you laughing, ma'am? Ah. Was it hard for you, sir, that she was kind of a little bit off or behind you or anything? No? You were totally dialed in? (laughs) Did did anyone have like the person, like someone get ahead of them right next to them and it made it a little harder, right? Like you're, you're trying to add a little more like, oh God, I'm trying to stick with it, right? Some of you probably like quit, okay? That's Stroop Test Part 1, that's the easy part. Oh. If you're colorblind, you're exempt from this test. So... Now, this is the same word, same font. Instead of reading the word, you have to say the color. So you have to say blue, red, green, blue, yellow, blue. All right. Now do you need to stretch? (laughs) All right. So out loud as a room, as fast as we can go. We just did like 10 seconds on the other one. Ready? On your marks. Get set. Go. It was not 10 seconds. <laughs> You'd rather run. Raise your hand and be honest if you quit. Thank you. So we add that little cognitive interference and all of a sudden our reaction time of a task goes way down. When our athletes play and their minds are like this, right, versus like this, they don't play better, they play worse. The more sideline coaching that we give, that's not the better what they're going to do, the worse they're going to do, especially if what you're yelling is in complete opposition to what the coach is saying, which happens very often as well. Right? So I think this is what it feels like when there's two coaches on one side and 42 on the other side yelling instructions. Now, when I asked your kids this morning, and when I asked 10,000 plus kids a year that I speak to, what would you like your parents to say on the sideline of the game? What do you think they say? Nothing, right? Parents always know this. Nothing. The kids are like, nothing. Really, once they get to high school, like, I don't even care if they come. (laughs) Right? 
So they don't want us to say anything. They appreciate when we cheer. They like that we acknowledge they're there. But they don't need it or, or want our advice. And what we have to be really careful about with, with young kids in sport, when we're coaching them from the sideline, I was telling the group tonight, it, it, we're stealing the reps. We're stealing the reps, right? If you went to the weight room and at, you know, lift 8, 9, and 10, you just grabbed the bar and pulled them for something, they're not getting better, right? They have to struggle. Every time we steal the reps, it takes them longer to learn stuff. And the more dynamic and cognitively challenging the game, the more reps they need. So every time you give the answer, it just delays learning. And I've taken over groups of kids where they're always looking to the sideline for the answers. But the intelligence has to be on the field. It doesn't need to be on the sideline. So coaches have to be better at this, and parents have to be better at this. Right? Don't steal those reps. Right? We don't want them playing like that, because that's really hard. Right? That's really tough. So, any questions so far? And we'll do time for Q&A at the end as well. Okay, perfect. All right, so in my book, um, I talk about how do we strip away this interference. I talk about sort of the, uh, the seven C's of a high-performing state of mind. All right, common sense, the right conditions, good communication, caring and unconditional love, control and ownership, competence and confidence. And all these things work together in conjunction and they feed off of each other. And if one of these pieces is missing, it starts to break down. And so the book is all about, hey, how can we understand each of these areas from a research perspective? How can we talk to our kids? What kind of questions we can ask our kids so that if they're struggling with something, well, which, which one of these areas might it be? And I just want to talk about a couple of them here tonight because we obviously don't have time to go over all of them. But a, a couple of important areas, right? So number one, control and ownership of the experience. The, the critical ingredients of long-term participation in, in, in sport is autonomy, which is control, right? Um, enjoyment, competence or mastery, and those things breed intrinsic motivation. Right, intrinsic motivation to, to go out and, and, and get it. So a lot of parents ask me, like, do you think my kid has a chance to make it in sport? And I'm like, do they go and pick up a ball outside of practice? Because if they don't, no, they really don't. Right? But if they're intrinsically motivated to go and get better at something, then that's pretty cool. We got a, you know, we got a trampoline this year, and I wish I videotaped this. I'm an idiot for not doing this, but just watching my son from June 1st when we got it over the course of the summer um, trying to learn a backflip. And he started this summer of like, um, you know, the most ugly front flip you've ever seen, and then sort of a side flip, and then just fear and everything. And then the other day he's like, Dad, look at this. And he just did a standing backflip, didn't even jump. And I was like, ah, oh, so cool. But day after day he was intrinsic. I never said, TJ, go jump on the trampoline. Right? Now, people say, oh, my kids aren't, you know, intrinsically motivated about sport. But I think that's because a lot of times we do sport wrong, right? And, oh, kids these days have no motivation. I'm like, really? Because they're really motivated to play video games. I've never met a parent who's like, can you get my kid to play more Fortnite? Right? But what do video game makers do? They, they understand what engages people. Kids are, they own the experience, right? They're, on, they're with their friends. They can level up in certain ways. There's no one standing behind them yelling directions. Right? But the biggest thing is they ask kids over and over, they ask users, how can we make this better so you'll play more? Right? And then they implement that. We're terrible at, we're good at asking in sport. We're terrible at implementing. So I think one of the ways you can give your kids ownership, I, I have my teams do goal setting. And what I do is this, I, I ask my kids to send, you know, set like three individual goals and three team goals for the season. And then I ask their parents to do the same thing independently. And I say, before you hand in your goals to me, sit down and compare with your kids. See why they're here. Now, I think really young kids, you have a seven-year-old, they're not going to do goal setting. They can have goals of enjoy this, you know, work hard, fulfill your commitment. Like, I think those are good things. But I think for the most part, um, 
for, for you know, other kids, if your goals for, for why your kid's in sport and their goals are way off, it's a really dangerous thing. I've coached kids, you know, their parents are like, I want her to play at Stanford, and the girl's like, I don't even want to play in high school. Like, this is a big problem, right? And it can ruin your relationship with your kids. So getting on the same page and accepting their, their, their goals for being there are really important. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have expectations, and it certainly doesn't mean that as a parent, right, I'll give a perfect example. So my daughter is a December birthday um, U15 soccer player. She's still in eighth grade. I love my daughter to death. She hasn't picked up a ball outside of practice in two years, right? And she can kind of hang with the group and she does good, but she doesn't work on her game. And that's totally fine. I'm totally fine with that. Except when her coach says, we're U15 now. We're going to a college showcase event in February in Austin, Texas. And I just turned to my wife and I said, she's not going. A, she's in eighth grade. B, she's not trying to be a college soccer player. So why would I send her to Texas to play soccer? Because I'm pretty sure the level of her team, I can get her like 50 good games within driving distance, right? And so she's not making a commitment to the game that warrants that kind of financial commitment from our family, right? I love her to death. I'll take you to all the local games. We want to drive to Seattle, that's okay. But I'm not putting you on an airplane to do something that you've shown no interest in really doing. And I think as a parent, we can do that, especially as some, you, know, you said before, the expense of sports, right? Um, so as a parent, we have the right to do that. But I think we have to be very careful if we're forcing that on them and they're really putting in, you know, their, their level of commitment and intrinsic motivation is, is, is not of that same level. Because right? they'll comply for a while and then they'll eventually just walk away. So let them own it. Accept their goals for playing. Number two, the right conditions. And there's a lot of things that we can talk about here, but I think one of the big ones is, right, right, embrace the desirable difficulties that sports brings, the challenges. We don't want to be helicopter parents. We don't want to be, in Canada, they say snowplow parents, right? Because we just plow all the obstacles out of the way. This is, you, you know, you had uh, two years ago, was it? Julia Lithcott Hames, how, how to Raise an Adult. Great book about, you know, when we remove all the obstacles for our kids, they're woefully unprepared, unprepared for life of obstacles and what, throws, what the world throws at them. So we have to be super, super careful that we let sport throw difficult things, not dangerous things. Doesn't mean we accept you know, bullying or coaches calling our kid fat or something like that. But it does say, you know, I get emails of like, the, my kid's coach is a, a bully and dangerous. How do I get him removed? My son has been number nine his whole life and now he has to be 10. I mean, I get these emails. I'm like, come on, right? But there's difficult things, losing a starting spot. I had a guy on my podcast named Terry Steiner, who is the um, US Olympic national team women's wrestling coach. And he was talking about when his daughter in eighth grade finally got on a volleyball team where she wasn't a starter and she was devastated and crying. And he said, this moment right here is a teachable moment. We have to use it, she is ready to learn from this right here of what she wants to do in volleyball so this doesn't happen again. Not let me go complain to the coach, not let me go do that. Now one of the biggest places that we have to embrace desirable difficulties is on the ride home, right? The ride home after game, in exit interviews with athletes and research from universities, when they ask kids what is your worst memory of sports, the ride home. Because right, they're physically and emotionally exhausted and we have them locked in the car. And we're going to make it a teachable moment. And kids tell us over and over and over that maybe this is the least teachable moment. Now it doesn't mean that some kids don't want to talk about the game. My daughter, every time she plays, she yelled, the first thing in the car, how do you think I did that? Right? My son, that question has never occurred to him once. Right? Now, if I make the car ride home a time 
to talk about it when he's just decompressing, eventually he's not going to want to ride home with me. Right? Too many kids hate this time. The video here, uh, HBO did a documentary a couple of years ago called Trophy Kids. Has anyone seen this? Trophy Kids. Um, it's really interesting. This is a documentary. This is actual ride home footage. Did you tell the coach to put you inside the game? Yep. How many times? I was standing right next to him. Are you sure? Because I stood right next to you. I, tried, I was by him as many times as I could be. Dude, you're, you're not getting it done. Let me explain something to you. If you do something wrong, do I tell you? Yeah. Okay, I correct it. Or I tell you so you can correct it. How do you know what to correct if you don't even know why he pulled you out of the game? What did I tell you about that? What, are you scared of them or something? No. So why don't you go ask him? Like right now, you know we're going to have this conversation after the game. You know it's coming. Okay, this is part of you becoming a young man. If someone does something, you're just going to take it? So if I was to walk up to you and just slap you inside your face, what are you going to do? Just turn around and be like, I don't know why that guy did that. It doesn't make any sense, Jay. You act like you're 10 or 9 or 8. Dude, you're just going through the motions. If you're going to be selfish, you know what? You have other brothers and sisters. Okay, We'll take you from out of that school and give them a chance and put them in a private school. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. It confuses me. What's the problem? Every time I come back, like in the car, I always feel like I'm in trouble or I did something wrong. Well, did you? Yeah. You've had more personal training than any of those kids out there. Okay. Back to the drawing board. Back up to getting early, back up inside the morning. Okay. Because it doesn't make any sense. You have me driving back and forth from this school, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, for you to go out and do absolutely nothing. I don't understand why you don't get it. I don't understand it. So we posted that clip on our Facebook page, and it was this really interesting discussion back and forth from people. Some people saying, you know, this poor kid, look, he's crying in the back seat. It's a prison. And other people saying, you know, that dad is making this, that family is making this commitment to put him in a private school, right? And I agree with both things. But here's the problem. That conversation can't be had there every single day when he feels like the car ride home is a prison. Now that dad loves his kid, definitely. But this is not helping. Does anyone remember how that ended? Trophy kids. He quit football, and then he moved out. Right? He moved out. So we put this on our Facebook page, and this conversation went back and forth. And then this guy chimes in, and he says, I was the cameraman. That was me sitting in the front seat. And he said, you know, the dad was a college football player, loved his kid. I think he got drafted, and he either got injured or he got tr legal trouble. And so he never made it to the NFL. So his son was going to make it in his place. But he never asked his son. He never asked his son. You never saw that whole documentary, his son with a smile on his face around his dad. Right? And to me, that's really sad. Now, there's no sporting achievement worth losing your relationship with your kid. And that's not the way to get the most out of them. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't have conversations with our children or, you know, as a coach with my team, I say very little after a game because there's rarely, nothing I really ever have to address after, right immediately after a game that I can't address before the next practice or in the hotel when they're actually ready to learn. Now, if they do something, if my kids did something like um, that is not okay as a family, Right? If my kids cursed at a referee, if my kids spit on someone, I would address that here and there. Parent to child, not as a segue into, you know, and why does Jenny play striker all the time, you know, or something like that. Now, I think this is so hard because we love our kids and we just want to help. This is such a tough thing. When my son was five, um, his first 
season of soccer, I was so proud. I was a coach. Was, my son's going to play soccer. He goes to his first practices, and he's having fun. We go to the first game. He walks on the field. He goes, oh, I don't want to play. He walks off. All right, and I'm like, okay, you know, fair enough, whatever. And the other kids play, and he sits on the side, and he watches them play. Goes to practice that week. He's totally fine. He's having fun. Week two, there's a game before us, a bunch of tall adults yelling at little kids playing. He's like, Dad, I don't want to play again. And now I'm embarrassed. I'm angry. I'm supposed to be the all-star coach, right? My own kid won't play. He's totally happy because he found like a cricket or a lizard or something. <laughs> He's totally entertained. I'm miserable. So we get in the car after, and I'm, I'm, I'm upset. And it's been bothering me. And I'm like, TJ. And all of a sudden, wham, I get karate chopped by my wife who's sitting next to me. I was like, what was that for? She goes, really? Didn't you write a book about this? <laughs> right? So it's hard. I get it. But we have to understand that, right, if we truly love our kids, understand. Now, if they bring the game up, if they want to talk about it, here's three questions I always ask my kids when they say, Dad, how did I do? I come back at them. Well, what went well today for you? What needs work? What did you learn from today that you can work on in practice next week so you do better next weekend. Whether they scored three goals and had their best game ever, or whether they had an awful game, what went well, what needs work, what did you learn today? And that consistent thing, and they're like, why do you always ask that? I'm like, yeah, and I'm always going to ask that. Because I want you to understand what went well. And I'll give you feedback if you ask, right? But what went well, what needs work, what did you learn today? It's going to make you better next week. And that's a huge thing. And then the last thing in this piece of caring and unconditional love, and this was really the sort of takeaway of my TED Talk, that after your kids play, honestly, one of the, the, the best thing you can say to them is, I love watching you play. That's it. I love watching you compete. I love the fact that you're out there. Whether they have a great game, whether they have a, worse game, uh, a bad game, I love watching you play. It wasn't your week. You know, just work hard and practice that week, this week. And, you know, it, it, it's amazing when you see their face light up. And I say it, you know, I love going skiing with you. I love going camping with you or whatever. Um, you see their face light up because they know that, you know, my love for them is not dependent on, you know, whether they scored four goals or how they play in, in some silly sport. Right? It's unconditional. And I get more phone calls and emails about this than anything else. And they usually start with something like, hey, I thought that was kind of dumb, and it's changed my relationship with my kid. Some people are like, you know, I, I, I called my 23-year-old and told her for the first time ever, ever, you know, I loved watching you play, and I don't think I ever told you that. And she broke down crying, or he broke down crying. Right? Because our kids want to make us happy. Right? They, want, they want us to be proud of them. And just telling them we love them gives them that freedom and strips away interference that if I'm not having a good game, it's okay. My dad, my mom still loves me. It strips away this interference. And it's so, so powerful. We tell our teams that I work with, right, love is the greatest competitive advantage. I right, love your kids. It gives them the greatest competitive advantage. When I coached kids who I knew this wasn't happening, when I knew that the ride home was going to be miserable, man, it was not a good situation. Like you'd see like 15 minutes to go in the game, they'd start looking to the sideline. And the game would go downhill, or they'd get really animated and they'd act out because that was the only way that they could deal with the emotion of what was going to happen in the car ride. And it was really, really sad. And you'd see them changing their shoes after the game and go, ah, Joe, I wish I was driving home with you. Right? I don't want to go home with my dad today. So, if you take nothing from tonight except that, tell your kids you love watching them play. If that's not something you've never said before, right? Initially, they might be like, you know, who are you and what'd you do with my dad? Like, that's okay. All right? That's okay. All right? So, a couple recommended books. Um, one in the middle is average. Don't worry about that one. Um, Carol Dweck, Mindset, I didn't really talk about that much tonight, but um, I just think it's an excellent book on fixed and growth mindset and what drives performance and how we praise our kids. 
Uh, Power of Moments is a great one. The brothers Chip and Dan, Dan Heath. Um, they, that book is about, you know, about 80% of the memorable experiences in our life happen before our 18th birthday. And sports is filled with moments of what they would call elevation, pride, insight, and connection. Those are moments that stick. And if we are intentional about those moments, when is a teachable moment? When are they open to learn something? What is their emotional state? Then that's how sports can become transformational in their lives. Okay? Um, I wasn't, I think it's worth showing one more video here because I really do think that what's happening in this school district is they're trying to do things differently. We have these values and standards that you're going to hear more and more about, respect and integrity and, and competitiveness and perseverance that is going to be coming from coaches to the athletes, to the teachers, and extending the educational mission across athletics. You, as a community, have leadership that's committed to becoming a model community, creating a movement that keeps more kids in sports. And so my last video for you, since we do have time, is how do we create a movement in three minutes or less? If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public. Be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here... Did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. That's how we roll in the Northwest. Don't legalize pot. So I love this, uh, this video because this idea in this community, right, you've already got, right, the shirtless dancing people. 
But it's not about them, it's about followers. You already have a bunch of first followers, and I hope that all of you in this room will also become first followers. Would it be nice to have up and down and every seat packed? Of course. But if you share this with a couple people, four or five, you share this message, you share the book, you share the Positive Coaching Alliance or any resource, if you make a commitment within your team to say, hey, we're going to do things differently. See, I, I truly think that in any team I've coached, you know, if there's 16 families, it's like there's a couple of like perfect ones and usually it's like their fourth kid and they just don't care anymore, right? And then... And then there's like one or two that are like off the, you know, off the reservation. And then most people are in the middle. And if we pull the people in the middle to this end, all of a sudden the environment becomes very uncomfortable to not be dancing, right? To not be bought in. And that's how change is made. So find your bright spots. Find those teams. Find those programs that are doing it right and point them out. This is what the district's gonna start doing. Find those athletes doing things the right way and point them out. That's how you make a movement. That's how you transform a community. And you have a great start, but the hard work is also just beginning. And you know what? You might not see the fruition to it until your kids are done and gone. But great changes, and again, like I said, the wellness movement is this next big social movement in this country, right? The people who, who lead that movement, they don't care who gets the credit. They're okay if it, doesn't, if it doesn't finish in their lifetime, but they're still okay with it. We need your help, right? Your leadership, your superintendent, your board, your athletic director, your principal here, right? They're bought into, we're good but we can be even better. We can make this experience transformational for our kids, transformational for our coaches, transformational for our parents, right? And that's up to all of you to share this. So let me give you my, here's all my contact info. That's my direct email that goes to me. Um, website, if you Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, that's how you connect with us. It, we have the podcast called Way of Champions. I have a couple copies of my book in the back. They're $15. Happy to sign it for you. There's a vigorous black market. You can sell it tomorrow for $16. <laughs> right? But I'd love to get a book in your hands, either a hard copy there. A lot of you have it. If you have a copy and you brought it, let me sign that for you as well. Um, or if you want the ebook. You can just go to changethegameproject.com forward slash free CTG book. It'll ask you for your email. You can have the PDF. Just don't tell my publisher. Okay? But I want to put this information in your hands, and I hope that you'll share that link. I hope you'll share this information because we need to make sports about the needs and the values and the priorities of our children. And if we do that, if we put the players first, then we can transform team by team, school by school, community by community. And I think it's high time that this happens. I hope that you'll join me in, in doing this for our kids, okay? Thank you all so much. Thank you. We have time for questions, yeah? So if you have a question, please ask. Uh, we have some microphones there. Um, they'll have, I see a question right there. As a former player and coach, how do you balance the wanting everyone to be happy maybe in grade school or middle school to that conversion when they get to freshman, sophomore, junior, senior in high school where everyone can't get a blue ribbon and maybe just some encouragement. My, I, I think of my girls sometimes, they get on the floor and it's almost like they're in a zombie mode and I want to snap them out of it while the game still has time but I don't want to go overboard like maybe we saw in that video. How do you do it as a coach to help encourage them versus maybe degrading them by, by yelling? Yeah, so it's a great question. So, you know, certainly as someone who's worked in both school sport and club sports, I'm a firm believer in club sports that when I ran clubs and now when I coach my own group, if you pick them, you play them, right? So every one of my kids plays a lot even up to when I've had nationally ranked teams and we're at the biggest events or playing in a state championship or regional championship, right? Every kid will start a game, right? We go to Portland for two games. Anyone who doesn't start on Saturday starts on Sunday. I don't have 11 starters and five reserves. I have 
16 kids who get to play at different times of the game. So I think that's huge in club sports at any age. And I think it's a great disservice to kids when all of a sudden they're told at 11, you're not a starter, right? Do I have a best 11? Yeah. And I always tell my kids it's more important you're on at the end. We had a discussion at lunch, at lunch today that, you know, as we get one of the biggest challenges in school sport is what's most important, right? To give as many kids an opportunity to be on the roster or to get kids meaningful playing time. Because you can't have a soccer team with 30 people on it and give everyone playing time, right? So it, at the high school level, can we understand that, yeah, I might be on the roster, but I might not play. I think a 16, 17 year old should be able to understand that and be motivated to go do the work and, and, and get better, right? And every sport is different for the, you know, football might offer special teams as an opportunity to play. You know, soccer's got 11, volleyball, you know, you only have so much gym space and, and so much space to do that. Um, hockey, you only have so much space on the ice. Um, with your kids, it's always concerning to me when, when kids are, you know, you, just to use your word, zombies, like they're, they're out of it, right? And I think the kids who I see are zombie-like oftentimes are kids who are really overscheduled, right? I, I mean... It, they should show up and like, yes, it's sports, thank God. But it's like, if it's like, well, we swam before school and now it's soccer and then we go to piano, right? That's where I see the, the, the zombies. And then it's usually, okay, we got to cut something back. Each one of these things is great, but the sum of all the parts is less than the whole, right? So sometimes those kids just need a break. Now people say like, oh, my, my eight-year-old only wants to do this. I'm like, my eight-year-old only wanted to eat macaroni and cheese but I knew better, right? So no, we're gonna take some time off and then you know, if you really love this, you'll be hungry to come back. Um, so I don't know your kids and it's really hard, I speak in generalizations, but they all end at the individual level. But having good, you know, this whole chapter about communication is about how do you have conversations? So you know, how do you talk so kids will listen? Listen so they'll talk? How do you frame sentences so that you're validating what they're saying, but you're also, you know, you know, getting your point across. Um, I wrote the chapter with a friend of mine, a uh, lifelong friend who's a hostage negotiator. I was like, if anyone can talk to teenagers, it's a hostage negotiator, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, I, I hope that's helpful, but just talk to your kids and why do you see, why, you know, you, you got there and you look like you're kind of not into it today. Do you need a break, right? Are you tired? Are you not sleeping? Do you need a break? My son, my, my son, my son's like that sometimes. I'm just like, hello, like, you know, we're here, right? Um, as a coach, I very much believe, like, I, I, I do cueing things of this is when practice starts, right? So we, my teams come together in a circle and we put our arms around each other, we look each other in the eye, and the circle means all the other conversations are done and practice has started now, right? And you will hold each other accountable for what we stand for. That's sort of the cue that it's time to get going. And some days, you know, I used to look at and go, what's wrong with these kids? But especially now I coach 11 and 12 year old boys who really are not made for sitting in school all day. So some days I'm like trying to teach something and then I'm like, mm, you know what? Who wants to just play? They're like, yeah, right? And like, right, let's just play. And how can I make a game that'll teach them and it'll get them motivated and excited to be out here as well? Like some of my worst coaching is always done on like the first day of school when I think I'm gonna get a lot of teaching done. Right? And the kids just like, they just need to run around. Um, and, and so, I don't know, there's probably a lot of reasons behind it, but talk to your kids. But in the heat of the game, do you ever up your to get them to do something in the moment? Uh, yes, sometimes not in a good way. Sometimes, yes. I mean, you know, there's a difference between like shouting and yelling, right? I coach soccer. If you're 75 yards away, I can't be like, hey, Billy, Billy, right? But what I also have to recognize as a coach is that everyone needs information differently. Some players, right, if you yelled at me as a player, that responded and got me going. Other people, their head goes down and they're there. So one of the art of coaching is recognizing that he needs a quiet word and he can take something across, across the field. And, and understanding that I don't coach a sport, I coach a person and everyone needs something different. And so if I can recognize that amongst my players, I'm gonna reach more of them. If I approach it as one size fits all, and if you can't take me doing this, that's fine. Now this doesn't mean, right, as an athlete and I'm playing 
basketball and I'm losing my man and my coach says, get on your man, right? That's not like, hey, can you come over here? See your man, he's why he just made the layup. Yeah, you can't let him happen, right? Like I gotta say, get on your man, right? And I think as an athlete has to accept that. But an athlete can also say, hey, the coach, pull me aside. So I always ask my, so I ask my kids, I make them fill this out when we do goal setting. I have them complete this one sentence for me. One thing I wish my coaches knew about me that would help them coach me better is dot, dot, dot. And sometimes I get like, I don't like being first in line because I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Or, you know, I don't like to demonstrate things. Or if, you know, if you see, you know, if you want to correct me, tell me one-on-one. -on -one. I like that better, right? And then sometimes I get things like, my parents are getting divorced and my dad's got cancer. So if you see me upset, like, please understand that it's not that I don't care. And that's some pretty cool insight too. So, yeah. Are there questions? Uh, right here, and then we'll get you there. Right here, yeah. All right, the, exactly. you just on the microphone? Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what I want to ask, except that I want to know the work that you do with coaches and how receptive they are and sort of, you know, all of us as parents want to be better parents. Do coaches really want to be, really want to take this information and do something with it? It's a great question. Um, I think most of them do, yes. I think, right, uh, let me just dispel the myth that coaches get into it for the money, <laughs> right? Especially in high school sports, right? Um, so yeah, I think most of them want to do right. I, I think a lot of coaches feel very beat down right now, right? That anytime they, they bench a kid because he or she's not living up to the standards, they're worried that, you know, not that the kid will, you know, when I was growing up and I did, you know, and I wasn't playing, my dad say, would say, go talk to your coach. And then we went to this arena where if that didn't work, maybe my dad would talk to the coach. You know, but that rarely happened. My dad just told me to sort it out myself. Um, then it became, we skipped the coach and go to the AD. Then we had an era of we skip the AD and go to the principal. And now, sadly, we're living in an era, era where it's like we skip the whole school and we go to the board, right? And then the board goes, well, geez, what, what's wrong with the principal and athletic director? Why is this coming to me? Yet it's the first they've heard of it. So please understand that you know, a lot of coaches, are, they're, they're trying super hard. If they have 50 kids on the team, your kid gets 1 50th of their attention and gets 50 50ths of your attention. Right? So they might not see things that you see. So I encourage really open dialogue. I think if coaches communicated better ahead of time, let people know where kids stand, let them know, you know, catch them being good. If they think something's wrong, send them a quick note. I send lots of emails to my, like, you know, for Billy, and I would send it to the parents so they've read it, and they see that, hey, I saw the kid, and I see him struggling with this, and then I get the call back, like, I can't believe you noticed that. Yeah, something's been going on with him. Let me find out what it is and let you know. Um, we teach coaches about transformational coaching. We teach coaches about understanding that they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Um, we teach them how to build great teams and great connections. Um, and yes, in every audience, someone's there with their arms folded because they've coached this way for 30 years and they're not gonna change no matter what. They've never won anything, but they're right. <laughs> Right, and, and I, that's really, I, I could spend all my emotional energy worried about them, but I'd rather take the, the young, excited coaches in the middle and do that. And I think what we have to do is, is do a better job of educating our coaches when they're young. I think the sport governing bodies in this country who say, hey, guess what? Any high school kid playing lacrosse can take coaching education for free would be doing themselves a huge service because you're start educating your next generation of coaches. But I think for the most part, you know, coaches care. I look at my own kids' coaches sometimes. Of course, not me, because I'm awesome, but no. Um, no, uh, like, you know, they, they go and they have a great, you know, club volleyball coach and they go to their school volleyball and oh, she's not as good as whatever. I'm like, okay, but you can still learn something, right? There's something there. She's not mean to you, right? You're having fun. You're with your friends. You can get something out of this, right? No, and my coaches, my kids think I stink, but anyway. Yeah, great question. Uh, did you still have a question there? Yeah. You can you use the microphone? It's probably <laughs> hard for them to hear you in the back. 
Yeah, I think you mentioned at one point that kids up to around the age of 13 who uh, are really dedicated to only a single sport are much more likely to quit that sport or quit activity altogether um, as opposed to children who are involved in multiple sports. And um, I was wondering why that is so and also how do you avoid sort of that jack of all trades, master of none mentality that I think sometimes people get uh, whether it's sports or something else where they're overscheduled, they have you know five or six things they all want to do, but then you start to worry, or sometimes they start to worry, if I'm not spending more time doing the one thing that I think I'm really good at, like, am I wasting my time? Mm -hmm. Fan fantastic question. So I highly recommend this brand new book, it probably should make my, my slide here, uh, called Range, uh, by an author named David Epstein. Uh, he wrote a book a couple years ago called The Sports Gene, and Range just came out a couple months ago. I did an interview with him in my podcast, if you want to listen to it. The subtitle is Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. And so what it really talks about is how um, if our race is that I want to be the best 11-year-old no matter what, then by all means specialize, right? But if your finish line is somewhere later, right, I want to be a high school varsity athlete or, or play later on, um, being a, a, a generalist is super important. The problem with early specializers is they often don't sample enough things. Like what if they don't find the right match, right? They only found soccer, they only found lacrosse, they only found baseball, but they might have a, a better match in a, in a better sport. Um, the other thing, you know, sometimes, and to be fair to Angela Duckworth, she talks about this in her research um, around grit and resilience. You know, sometimes being too gritty is a bad thing, right? Beating your head against the wall on something that you're not good at is not necessarily the best path forward, right? There, there is a genetic component to, to, you know, learning. If you put a group of 100 random people through the same exact cardiovascular program, they all won't improve the same amount. Some people um, you know, have VO2 max and other genetic characteristics that allow them to be better no matter what. So you can train till you're dead and you'll never run you know, a two hour marathon and you will probably be dead trying to run a two hour marathon, right? Um, so, it, so it's tough. Now, the thing is, a lot of those kids, right, if they do too much, they get injured, and so that drives them out. They can develop identity issues around their sport. So instead of John, the guy who plays soccer, I become John, the soccer player. Well, now if I get injured or now if I get cut, right, all of a sudden my whole friend group's gone. My whole everything's gone. And uh, it's amazing, I have a friend who runs a wilderness rehab center. And he said, you know, about 70% of my people are former athletes that got injured or cut and out of sport. And, and they didn't know. Like, I think athlete transitions is one of the biggest areas coming up in sport. Um, because we've got people like Michael Phelps and Kevin Love talking about depression and mental health issues in sport. They've got millions of dollars. They're going to land on their feet. Right? But what about the athlete in college? What about the high school athlete? What about the 13-year-old who just did her knee for the second time and has to stop playing? Those transitions are really, really tough. So I, I can't answer your question perfectly, um, except to say that um, you're right. Maybe two things is good. Being a multi-sport doesn't necessarily also mean being multi-travel sport. So sometimes I think a better word is multi-movement, right? So yeah, I play soccer, but um, I do parkour or martial arts, right? Or tumbling or something like that that gives me yoga, that gives me a multi-movement experience and develop strength and conditioning. I consider that a sport, right? In terms of that teaches me to move correctly in different areas that my sport might not train me in. Um, so it doesn't mean I have to play travel basketball, baseball, ice hockey, and soccer, right? Because yeah, then that can be too much and then you become a master of none. So everyone's different. So kids who are a little more athletic can probably balance more and some people really have to put more time in one just to stick with their group. And that, that can go family to family and child to child within a family. But 
again, if, if your child is intrinsically motivated and wants to do a lot of one thing, it doesn't mean you prevent them from doing a lot of one thing, but you can frame that as these other things will help you get better at that one thing. And I think that's a really important thing. Okay. One more, right? Uh, oh, uh, I think right in front of you there, he had a question. And then, hey, if, if we don't get to your question here, like I'm going to walk back there and sign some books, and you're welcome to kind of stand in line and uh, ask me there too. I'll stick around as long as you need. I'm just interested, since you've worked with all the different levels from youth all the way through professional sports and international sports, how often or do you run into an environment, an environment where um, you, sp you speak a lot about communication, um, but you run into an environment where it's not a safe environment for the player, whether it be an international player or a youth player, to go to the coach because of retribution or they may talk about that player outside of, outside of the team. Does it happen more frequently at the higher levels, the lower levels? How do you deal with that? I, I, uh, that came up today a couple times, and it's a great question. Um, I mean, obviously at the high level, we just saw this awful thing with USA Gymnastics, right? And hundreds of cases of abuse, thousands of incidents of sexual abuse, many times with the parents standing in the room. But no one wanted to say anything because my kid might be out of the system. I don't want to be seen as a troublemaker, right? And I think that's incredibly sad. In other places, especially in like small towns where, hey, there's only one baseball club. If we rock the boat, if we go to the board um, and we get kicked out, there's no place else to go. My kid loves baseball. And it's a really hard thing, right? It's a, it's a really hard thing. I think the most important thing is you are the advocate for your child as a parent, right? You are the advocate for the human being first and the athlete second. And so you have to look at this and say, is this something that if this is a, you know, this is a difficult coach who's kind of a jerk and, and my kid's not learning a ton, is it gonna be the end of the world if we just make it through the season and move on versus is this a bully coach who's, who's cursing and, you know, is acting in a way that would never be okay in school. You know what, I, I need to speak up. Because what's the message that you're sending to your kids if you don't, right? And I don't think there's any sporting experience when you really think that 99.999% of kids are not gonna really make it to the next level anyway, that you say, well, I'll let my child be abused just for the chance that maybe we, we make it, you know? And so it's hard. I mean, I, I've seen some incredible coaches that I'd pay lots of money to coach my kids, and I've seen some highly respected coaches that couldn't pay me to get anywhere near my kids, right? But everyone, oh, look at all the scholarships they get their kids. I'm like, yeah, the, the 17 who are left, of the 100 they went through to get there, you know, 80 of whom don't play the sport anymore. So I think you have to, again, be the advocate, right? I've seen coaches push kids through, you know, again, we're much better on concussions now than we used to be, but get back out there with head injuries. And, you know, I've had some former athletes that just have lifelong things because, you know, in college or whatever, they got awful concussions and their lives are, their lives are ruined because of it. And it's really, really sad. So, you know, it, it, it's a hard thing, but I always say, you know, err on the side of caution for the human being in front of you. There's always a other sport they can play, you know, college sport or high school sports, not the be all and end all when the trade off is, you know, but she might have an, an eating disorder at the end of this, right? Which is something that happens a lot. So it's a tough situation. Uh, luckily, I have not been in that personally, and it's really easy for me to stand up here and give you advice when I'm not the one who's really faced with that. But I've, I think, helped a lot of people go through it, and I've gotten a lot of responses back from the people who said, thank God we pulled him out because of dot, 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 and others who said, I wish we had pulled him out because of dot, dot, dot. And that's really sad. So, okay. So, listen, you guys were awesome. Thank you. Thank you to everyone here at Unionville. Uh, Chad's and um, from the school, I don't know where our principal is or, or maybe he's, he's gone. He's getting ready for tropical day, um, <laughs> right? Um, for Pat as well, uh, I mean, thank you all so much. You were great. Uh, I just love 
love, love being here, and I hope that I get to come back soon and watch how we're implementing our values and our standards. So thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it.